no, no. Like a prime rib buffet at a Hindu wedding, this is a little later. Welcome, one and all, everybody. I'm Greg Kinnear, but during the May sweeps period, NBC here prefers, I refer to myself as Elvis's love child. <laughs> so could you too? Thank you. A few media bites up first. These are little bits and pieces from the news you may have missed today. Um, I guess you have heard, we've all heard about Paula Jones Paula Jones accusing President Clinton of sexual harassment last week. Well, on Friday, the president's attorney, Robert Bennett, held a press conference in the nation's capital to deny the charges. Here, what you'll see right now is him explaining how the president might have encountered Ms. Jones, though he has no recollection of ever meeting her. Take a look at this. When the president goes to a conference, it is commonplace and typical for him to meet lots of people it is commonplace and typical for there to be a room and facilities available to him to make phone calls. It is very commonplace when the president goes and speaks at a conference for individuals on his staff. Those, of course, are called pimps. <laughs> not mistaken. Oh, come on. Get out of here. You don't like it. Over there to GLH Hair Club for Men, if you're not satisfied. <laughs> Houston held its first annual Tattoo Expo on Saturday. Isn't that exciting? Oh, we were talking about that before the show, and there's a certain excitement about this news. We caught some of the inky activities on the NBC feed. Here's a look at some of the body art on display and the comments of tattoo enthusiast Rocky Beamgard. <laughs> I just like the art. I like skin art. Uh, having something new and different that other people don't have. It's gonna hurt like hell. <laughs> <laughs> Rocky went on to say, it's all worth it, that first magical moment you see a child run away crying in fear. <laughs> just capture that moment. Uh, if you've been watching later, you know Ollie North is running for the U.S. Senate seat from, I guess, Virginia. Uh, we know you turned to us for all your political news needs, so we've got a uh, follow-up on the campaign. North appeared before a group of supporters just last week, I guess, with these remarks. Take a look. Friends, I, I appreciate that warm welcome. I'm grateful to all of you here on this platform for encouraging this effort. Let me just talk about what we're here and what we're about today. We're here about family values. We're gathered here because we understand that it's families, not governments, that are the engine that drive this country. Of course, the family is the second engine. North sold the first one to the Contras to finance his campaign. So, <clears throat> be the second engine. Thank you. And finally tonight, John Bobbitt is back in the news. Apparently, he's been charged with battery by his new fiance, Christine Elliott. Christine isn't as famous as Lorena right now, but I believe that's about to change. Christina Elliott had been a topless dancer in Las Vegas for more than a year. It was here at Olympic Gardens Bar where she met and fell in love with John Wayne Bobbitt. John... She loved John Bobbitt. She loved him, she said. Christina Elliott quit her job at the topless bar last week, announcing that she and Bobbitt were getting married. Yes, indeed. Uh, Christine had apparently never heard about John's past because she doesn't have cable, but then again, John doesn't either, so... <laughs> Why? Why? Okay, fine. I actually think this is a perfect, perfect combination. I mean, she's topless, he's bottomless. I mean, what more... <laughs> We, uh, we gotta take a quick break. It could be a longer one than that, come to think of it. James Coburn's with us tonight. We'll be right back after these words. It's back to the man of the hour, from the man of all time, from Don King to Greg Kinnear. We're back. You're watching later. My nephew's class. <clears throat> my nephew's class started a trend among school kids across the country a couple of months ago. The 
The under 12 crowd is watching this show in droves, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, we got this uh, little package from Jeffrey Squietz. Is it Squietz? Jeffrey Squietz, fifth grade class at the uh, Oliver Ellsworth School in Windsor, Connecticut. It's called What Greg Does During Commercials. Uh, first up, Lauren McAllister folds his underwear into a paper airplane and flies it around. Whee! And obviously, uh, Lauren is not familiar that I always shave my legs before the program, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> this one from uh, Ali Pinehold. He plans his diet so he can fit into his Speedo. <laughs> uh, and, and it keeps Richard Simmons from coming back. No, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. He invited me to Barbara Streisand. Back off. This one from Scene C. Gooden. Try to swim in some quicksand. Oh, we pretty much do that here every night. Here I am drowning right there. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. There's a, there's a P.S. here. What is that? What's the P.S.? Oh, P.S. It's Sean. If you can't pronounce this, S-H-A-W-N. <laughs> it's only missing the words, you idiot, at the back there, isn't it? Ann Parker writes us, uh, check statistics to see what llamas like better, Pepsi or Pepsi Clear? Uh, actually, we've checked this out, and given two choices, most llamas prefer to die of thirst. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. Ryan uh, Curlew, he stuffs guacamole and hot sauce up his nose and blows it. Can we get a shot of this? Uh, this down here is my pet bat Rex, for those of you who are wondering. Uh, Joseph Karras, he tries to suck up his nose hairs with a dust buster. Well, the funny thing is it keeps short-circuiting because of all the guacamole and hot sauce that comes out of there. Finally, Dana writes, belly flops into audience. And, of course, with the words, help, hey, move it, wow, that's cool. And actually, we did this uh, during the last commercial break. And, sir, are you okay over there? Is everything, is everything all right? There you go, things we do during our commercial break. Thank you. I feel better having gotten that off my chest. Uh, my guest tonight, ladies and gentlemen, made his film debut in 1959 in Ride Lonesome. A few of his other films include The Magnificent Seven, Our Man Flint, and Charade. His latest is Maverick, and on May 13th, he's starring in the NBC TV movie Ray Alexander, A Taste for Justice. Recently got a star in the Hollywood Walk of Fame, so if you're planning on visiting a visit to L.A., please be sure to walk all over him. Ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> James Coburn! <laughs> Dapper here. Hey, that's what they keep saying, dapper, dapper. <laughs> dapper. That must be the key word. Yeah. Huh? It's a big later word. Yeah. It's a big 135 in the morning word. <laughs> uh, how are you? I'm well, thank you. you Listen, know, to those kids that did all of that thing, do they stay up and watch the show every night? Well, they know about me blowing guacamole and hot sauce out yeah, of my nose, they so they must. <laughs> you know, I, as I see, I look at you and I think, you walk out here and I think movie star. When, I, oh. when you walk out here, I mean, you really radiate something. And I was watching some old films over the weekend. I saw uh, uh, Steve McQueen in something and, and Audrey Hepburn. And I don't know if you feel the same way, but it seems like the, there's a mystique with some of the stars of your generation as opposed to what you see today. Yeah, I I, I've noticed that, too. They, they, I, I think it has to do with the way they shoot the films today. I mm -hmm. mean, they, 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 they used to spend a lot more time lighting. Like Audrey has a special lighting she had to have special lighting because of her, her strange features. She mm. looked beautiful. I, I did a film with Daudry uh, called Charade, and uh, they, had, they had a lighting cameraman who was supposed to be very good, Andre de Kay, uh, a Frenchman. But uh, he, he couldn't shoot women. And uh, so they brought in Charlie Lang, who was excellent with women, and uh, she made, he made her look beautiful, of course, as always. I think that has a lot to do with it. And then, uh, then of course, there's a, a different kind of film that's being made today. Mm -hmm. Uh, we, we shoot films today uh, in, in a much different fashion. Uh, there's not as much time spent on the individuals. It's mm -hmm. about, you know, the people light the background and then you kind of move through the light and darkness in, in the set. Right. And crank out the film. And crank out the film, yeah. Uh, yeah. And if the stories are different. I mean, then we, we, we 
tried to tell a story. Most of the scripts had stories to them. Now it has, it has to do with basically action. Mm -hmm. uh, the last few years with, uh, you know, some of the James Ivory uh, films that have been... Oh, those are great. Oh, they're wonderful. They're because but, you know, they tell the story and the characters get to play something between them. It's about relationships. It's about people. Right rather than mechanical men and uh, their flying machines and all of that. Right, and I know that when they start off to do a film, and if it is lacking story, it's not because that was initially the intention. Something goes wrong. You were in a huge film, Hudson Hawk, that had a lot of people saying, hey, this is going to be a big winner, and something went wrong. What went wrong with that oh. film? Um, it, it was probably about uh, three or four hours long in the first cut, and they cut it down to 95 minutes. Mm -hmm. Uh, it was a very stylized piece. I'm glad they did that, though. In <laughs> yeah, I, know. I think a lot of people are. Let's get out of here. <laughs> no, it was a good idea. Everybody thinks, uh, you know, uh, you never know a film is going to be a bad film. You always make it as well as you can. And uh, we started off, and uh, I, I, when, I, when I got the job, I asked the director, I said, well, uh, this is a very stylized piece. You are familiar with this kind of style. You say, well, if I can't do it, it's not going to work. Well... Uh, we had uh, more directors than, <laughs> than, than we had film. Uh, we, we, we had, well, Gerald Silver was uh, stepped in and gave us a hand with the directing and, of course, Bruce. Bruce when, you're on a, when you're on a set of a film like that, do you see maybe that, that something's going wrong, that there's going to be problems while you're making the film? Oh, yeah. You do? Yeah. 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 Well, we were four months in Rome. Yeah. And uh, then Rimini, we were in Rimini, then we went to... Uh, uh, Budapest, mm -hmm. and we finished the film in Budapest. Uh, we had a machine, the the, the gold making machine. It cost uh, something like a million, million and a half to make in London, mm -hmm. and then they had to tear it down, and then they shipped it to uh, Budapest, where they put it back together again. You know, God knows. It's how already long sounding like big problems to me. Well, you see, you see, <laughs> think little things like that. When when you you're standing in the middle of. Uh, uh, the, where the Trevi Fountain is, or the uh, uh, Piazza Navona in, in Rome. Right. And the director stands in the middle of it and he says, Well, what, what do you think we ought to do now? <laughs> you, you, that's when you know you've got problems, folks. That's when you know everybody's going to jump in with an idea. Well, listen, let's shoot this way. The sun's going to come down here in about three hours. So if we start off here, then we can go around here. You know, the sad thing is, every night I walk in here and I say, so what are we going to do tonight? Yeah. <laughs> let's talk about um, Magnificent Seven. Yeah. That, that was a film. This uh, film made you, uh, certainly, I think this was your breakthrough film. Yeah, well, yeah. You played a knife-throwing expert, if you will. Did you have to train and learn how to maneuver oh, yes, that thing? Oh, yes, yes, yes. I was sought by uh, the Farnsworth couple, uh, the, the brothers. Farnsworth is now uh, an actor, you know, mm -hmm. but he was a stuntman, and he, he and his son, uh, well, he taught me to, he said, well, you, you, here you go, get, get your knives, and I had these uh, switchblade knives, and he taught me to throw overhand, sideways. We had to invent the underhand throw uh -huh. because there's no way of really sticking anything uh, from any distance at all underhand because you can't control it. Right. I get pretty good with the the overhand. You could stick it oh, nine times out of ten in a in a big square with a circle drawn in it, a wood thing. You know, bang, bang. I broke down lots of door. I did, had it just by the uh, my my wife's boudoir, and uh, when the door was closed, <laughs> it was all right. But she would go in there and blunk. You know, occasionally the sure. knife would go off to the side sure. and uh, I would scare her a bit. Well, I got kind of good. <laughs> I know you had the underhand uh, motion down pretty, uh, pretty pat. In fact, here's a scene right now. Magnificent Seven, James oh, Coburn. Here, but uh, Ewell Brenner, uh, Ewell Brenner, such a uh, mysterious character to me. Did uh, uh, w w did you two get along well? I understand there were some problems during the oh, making of this film. I mean, there, there were problems, but uh, uh, Ewell, Ewell was a fine man. I, I, I got to know him later, and he was uh, he was a lot of fun. He was uh, a very strange guy. He was the king, you know, the king of Siam, and he was still the king of, of Siam when we were making the Magnificent Seven. <laughs> 
when he walked, he liked to have people, uh, not within 10 yards of him. He made this edict when we started work. He said, no one, well, when I walk around on, on set, no one within 10 yards of me, please. And he would walk out, you know, we would all be kind of walking around in a perimeter of 10 feet. I guess he didn't want us breathing on him or anything. I guess not. But he was, uh, he was an interesting guy. I liked him a lot. He was, uh, he had that, uh, the star quality, you know, that just radiated out of him. I don't know, uh, I'm sorry to see him gone, too. You know, Absolutely. Like uh... And George Rippard this weekend. Yeah, George died nice. last night, yeah. We're going to do a quick break. Be right back with Mr. James Coburn. Aha! We're back. You're watching later. We're talking with James Coburn. Uh, I was not aware that in the 80s, your career, you ran into some hard times with this arthritis, a very crippling, very serious uh, uh, Oh, yeah. Episode of this, oh, yes. Yes, it knocked me out for about eight years. I didn't have anything to do. I, I, I was healing myself. Now, of course, the doctors didn't know what it would cause. They don't have any idea what causes arthritis. Even to this day, they have no trace to it? Is it genetic? No. Yeah, well, it's genetic. There's, uh, yeah, with some people. Some right. people uh, have it uh, and haven't had no genetic background. Mm -hmm. my, my father had uh, arthritis. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was going through a divorce. And... Uh, I, I think that's what kicked it in. I was uh, suffering from a, a negative emotional experience, and all of a sudden I couldn't walk. My legs gave out, and I, you know, just to stand was a terrible effort. And uh, the doctor, of course, said, uh, well, uh, well, you're just going to have to live with it. I said, well, what causes it? Oh, we don't know. Here, drop these and uh, come back and see me. And, uh, yeah, no, I thought it was, <laughs> I said, well, I believe something causes it. And so I went through a whole healing thing. I went through... Uh, Fasting a long fast, 15 days fast, and uh, high colonics every other day for 15 days. Uh, food allergy, I was allergic to 47 foods out of 76 I was oh tested for. And uh, I stopped eating those foods, of course, and uh, went on a 90-day program. Friend of mine, uh, R.G. Armstrong, an actor, came over every day for 10 months to give me a deep tissue massage. He'd probably saved my life. And uh, I've been going at it ever since. It was strange that I've, I've been really fine until the earthquake. The earthquake kind of boom, shocked me into another really? thing. Yeah, and I've been getting, you know, a, a kind of a, a, a reaction from it. I asked my doctor, who's a wonderful doctor, he's, a, he's a, an MD, but he's also an acupuncturist, a homeopath, a, mm -hmm. a chiropractor. He, well, he does acupuncture on me three or four times a month. And uh, I asked him, I said, well, well it, 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 can the earthquake or some kind of a disaster like that shock uh, people? And he says, oh, yes, it happens all the time. Mm -hmm. Now, I didn't know that, but uh, evidently it's true that well, when people amazing. go through a heavy shock like that, uh, you don't know that you're having it, but unless you have a, a, a thing like arthritis where it kind of, bang, it can kind of, it kicks in. My hand has been sore, my shoulder has been sore. I'm able to get up and I'm walking around. I'm not too bad, but I've got a few kicks left. <laughs> you look all right Yeah, I feel it. I'm feeling okay And now. during this time, you started doing a lot of voice, voiceover work, too, as well, Yeah, right? I did. As a result yeah. of this, what, what, what ads might we hear you in if we're watching the television at home? Well, I do uh, MCI, something mm -hmm. for MCI, UPS. Mm -hmm. I did Acura for years. I do Labatt's Beer in Canada. I love the voice. You've got these, one of these deep voices that just... You listen up when you hear it. Ah, good. Well, and in fact, I'll tell you what. You want to try a little voiceover with us right now? What do you guys say? We try a little VO here. I'll tell you what. Uh, NBC just announced this week that uh, we have a new sponsor on board here on our, our little uh, late night broadcast. So uh, if you go ahead and read this for us, uh, it's uh, called Pure Sweat, and uh, I'll just go ahead and set that out there. Uh, three, two, and. These days, we all know how important it is to get into shape. But as you're working out, your body is losing precious fluids. Now you can put those fluids back in the, with Real Sweat Sport Drink. <laughs> the only drink that gives you back exactly what your body is losing. Real Sweat. Not some pre-sweetened kitty cocktail, because you're not sweating fruit punch. You're sweating <laughs> sweat. Well, we're back after this.
Mike will say anything to get a girl into bed. All you gotta do is tell girls what they want to hear and they'll fall for you. He's had sex with more than 60 women and he's only 18. Boy can't please me, I gotta move on to the next one. Now it's time for Mike to face the women he wronged. Three women say that Mike has been pregnant. This lying lover is about to get a harsh dose of the truth. By the time you're of middle age, 35 to 40, your Duracell will run out. On the next Montel Williams Show, today at 9 on TLV 12. We're back. Our guest tomorrow night, Jacqueline Bissett. Hope you'll tune in for that. You'll be writing a later letter to her, and we'll get to that in a moment. But tell me about uh, this film, Maverick. It opens Thursday, uh, Friday. Well, no, it opened. Well, it opens the twentieth. We're having the premiere on Thursday. I believe Thursday. that's a Friday, isn't it? Yeah, that looks like a Friday to me. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> this is what I do whenever we open a film on Friday. Yeah, Mel Gibson, Jodie Foster, James Garner, uh, Graham Greene. Uh, and who do you play? I play the Commodore. I'm, I own a, a gambling vessel on the on the river, where we have a big game, a big all rivers poker championship, draw poker championship. Yeah, it's, it should be a fun. If we had, a, if the film is as much fun to watch, I haven't seen it yet, as we had making it. I mean, it was like going to a party you'll, every day. You'll see it Thursday, right? I'll see it Thursday Big night. Premiere. The premiere, right? I didn't get an invite, but that's okay. Well, maybe we can work something out. <laughs> Dear James, uh, this is from Katie Seagal. Dear uh -huh. James is a little girl, ten years of age. I had a huge crush on you. Uh, I love the president's anal uh, analyst. Uh, is that one of your favorites? Yeah, it was one of my favorites. I produced the film, in fact. With oh. uh, it was Bob Evans' first film that he made when he went to uh, Paramount, when he first took over Paramount. A labor of love. It certainly was. Thanks for coming on. Thank James you. James Coburn, Thank folks, you. that's going to do it. We'll see you back here tomorrow night. Thank you.